All right, we are recording. Welcome to Ignite the Temple within day two. We get to the juicy stuff because today we're talking erotic expansion. And yesterday we talked a lot about mindset and I was thinking this morning kind of about the flow of this event and also the flow of the Nectary offer, which I will again be presenting at the end of this call. So just to orient you, I'm going to be going through this content. Today we're going to be focusing a lot on pleasure. I'm going to touch in on the erotic blueprints and what a valuable framework they are for understanding pleasure and arousal and feeding the body and how important that is. And then hopefully we'll have a little time for Q&A if there is any questions that come up. And then I'll give you fair warning and I will spend a couple minutes at the end, maybe five or 10, just going into my latest offer, which is such a pleasure to do. And I've even been like working on it more since yesterday, it's getting juicier by the moment. So stick around if that feels good and in your pleasure as well. So yesterday, I was thinking we kind of anchored almost into like two poles because when we talked about mindset, we talked A, about the foundational nature of it, right? Kind of like the rooting nature of mindset. It's the base from which everything else grows. And so in that sense, we kind of tuned into that like root chakra element, that like earth element, but also we're dealing with mindset, which is up here, which is always gonna be all over the place and definitely like more airy, more ethery. So we kind of like touched in on these two poles. And then today we get to focus in on like what's in between them, which is that sacral area, that potent center of creativity, which is your sex center as well. So today we're talking erotic expansion because I think this is one of the most critical areas that people lack as adults like you would think that as we grow older we would continue to expand and expand and become more and more expansive but so often what we actually witness when we look out in the world is people as they get older kind of getting more and more and more like stiff and small and constrained and so it's been such a curious thing for me to consider like where and when does this happen like why don't we continue on this pathway towards expansion where our elder years should really be where we're at our most wise, most expanded, most accepting, most nurturing, most understanding. And that often seems to be the opposite. People are really like stuck in their ways, you know, that like, get off my lawn sort of stereotype, you know? And I think that there is a real connection between how we engage with eroticism in our bodies, in our lives, in our culture. I speak as um, a, an American, I'm a Caucasian American woman. That's the identity framework from which I speak. Um, and I can see, and yes, as Beth Brown, the patriarchy conditioning also around older women. Yes, that yes, absolutely. Just taking that to a gendered place, this idea that women especially have like a real short shelf life. like. I used to read these, these sort of poetic, you know, poems maybe, or soliloquies about women and like, you know, the blush of the rose. And it was always this, this idea that like a woman was nothing until she hit this like minute window of desirability, at which point she was like the bud and it, you wanted to get that bud right before it opened because the opening was literally the moment. And once that moment passed, then she was just like, not useful anymore. You know? <laughs> I was like, okay, is this when you're 12? Is this when you're 14? Is this when you're 16? Is, I mean, there are lots of cultural models for when this magical moment of your femininity should be grasped and capitalized upon. And like, that's such bullshit. Blah. and it makes women really shut down and I mean there's just a lot to be said about that but definitely there is a cultural patriarchal conditioning story about women drying up right as they get older and losing their desirability which is of course the thing that's the most important but losing their desirability indicates that they've also lost all desire because that is only how a woman can interact with her desire is via her desirability for other people so 
that happens to women definitely based on like cultural, social, patriarchal conditioning. And I also was thinking that it, it kind of happens to everybody like through childhood. We talked a little bit about how creativity gets squashed through, you know, the beauty of the childhood imagination going through like schooling systems and social conditioning systems. And I feel that people's sexual expansion gets squashed in similar ways. Like if you think about the, the beautiful embodiment of a child, like loving being in their body, they're experiencing pleasure, they're moving their body, they're experimenting with different sensations or holding their breath they're going upside down they're spinning around and around it's just like what delicious sensations can i produce in this amazing vehicle that i have been gifted on this planet like it's an amazing you know period of self-discovery and i i remember the pleasure of having a body as a kid not as much in like a i didn't I don't remember so much like sexual feelings. I, I remember a lot of like embarrassment whenever I would see like, you know, kissing scenes in a movie or something like that. But it, it, it was a lot of just like, like I love being tickled. Like I just loved like having, having lots of sensations in my body. And I remember kind of like learning about sex and making this connection in my child brain that like, oh, sex is this thing that grownups get to do that's like really fun and really awesome. I can't wait until I get to do that. And then when I hit these like points like puberty, where suddenly like my body was developed, like I was maturing into somebody who could have sex. My hormones were like lighting me up, but then sex became not a safe place to explore, not a safe place to find myself. In fact, it was pitched to me as just 100% dangerous. Like you were going to get sick. You were going to be pregnant. You were going to get shunned. You were going to be a slut. Like, and, and this was all external. It was all about like what other people could do to you if you had sex. So I just shut that shit down. I mean, there are different ways of dealing with it. Some people went the other direction, you know, and was like, well, I'm going to do it all. And I went the opposite. I just shut it down. I was like, this is too dangerous for me. And that shutdown followed me throughout my, into my adulthood, even when it was totally safe and okay. And I was of age and nobody could tell me I was doing the wrong thing. I still had so much internalized shame around my desires, around my fears, around, you know, potential consequences, all of that stuff weighed so heavy on me. So I think a lot of us, we get conditioned into, into thinking we have to be or behave or look a certain way. And it shuts down our natural creativity, which is our sexuality. Like our sexuality and our creativity are in, indelibly linked. Like that's, again, something we kind of talked touched on yesterday. So yeah, I, I got a little, I got a little excited there and a little off topic, <laughs> but I think that's important just to, to relate that idea of sexuality and creativity and how both of those things can be compressed as we get older in ways that are antithetical to how we're designed. Like we are actually designed to continue to expand. We're designed to experience a lot, a lot of pleasure. So I wanted to touch briefly on that key word of pleasure too, because like mindset, I think it gets thrown around a lot and sometimes misunderstood and people are like, I mean, what if life sucks? Like what if some really shitty shit is going on and you want me to just be like happy about it? Like that doesn't make sense and that's stupid. And I get that. Um, so that's not, that's not really what we're talking about when we talk about pleasure. So I wanna touch in a little bit on like what pleasure is and what pleasure isn't. So like, I would say that pleasure is presence. Pleasure is being present with what is. And this is the, here's the rub with that. If you don't have a lot of pleasure practice, if you haven't done a lot of work processing your obstacles, your shame, your traumas, if you don't have support, if 
if feeling your feelings has been foreign for so long and you sit with what is, you might not like what you feel. And that's okay. Like, I just want a presence that that's okay. If you, if you sit with what is and it's not joy and it's not pleasure and it's not excitement and it's not ecstasy, that is okay. And that doing this work of re, essentially rewiring your body towards a pleasure response is something that any body can do. Like, if you have a body and you have been wired away from pleasure, you can rewire yourself back home towards pleasure. This is... This is within your power, ultimately, always. This is a possibility. So if you are at the beginning of that journey and you're dropping into what is and you're feeling sadness, be with the sadness. Be with the sadness with a, a spirit of loving curiosity. And I, and I can promise you, and I don't promise things very often, but if you do sit with what is and you do the work around rewiring yourself towards pleasure, you will get closer and closer and closer towards being able to drop in and feel that pleasure does exist somewhere in your body. Sometimes it's hidden from you and sometimes you gotta look for it. Sometimes it's right there, but it's there. It's like, it's in your cells. Like literally every, I want you to just think of that, like every one of your cells has a pleasure point, <laughs> essentially. And you could like touch into any one of them. And I just would love to invite us just now, even if you're listening on the replay, to take a moment and just observe your body, like do a body scan. You can go top to bottom, bottom to top, whatever feels good. And notice that when we're asked to scan our bodies, we're often being asked to look for <clears throat> tension, pain, discomfort, areas that need love and attention. So I want us, to, in this case, to scan the body and look for pleasure. Is there any part of your body that feels good? Like the tip of my left ring finger feels good, which is so random. <laughs> but it does. And then if you can find some little part of your body that feels good, See if you can imagine that you're turning a dial and you're turning it up just like one notch, like 1%. Can you bring just like 1% more pleasure to this part of your body? And you pull that pleasure from that part of your body and spread it to another. then just observe that you have the power to do that. You have the power to do that at any moment. This is like your superpower that you were born with. Just to cultivate your inner garden of pleasure. You get to decide what plants you wanna put there. You get to decide how big you want them to get. You can rain on them with some tears and you can shine your joy and sunlight on them. And this is not like a place that anybody else gets to control or take away. This is the temple within, right? This is like you are, you were put here to be a pleasure generator. Like you're, you can think of your body as like a pleasure generator. You were built you were built for it. And anyone who tells you that you were born to live this life for suffering and pain is lying to you. And it would be good to look at like what their motives might be for that. And I'm thinking specifically about like the capitalist system that makes us look outside of ourselves all the time for pleasure, right? We think pleasure is something that we have to buy. Pleasure is something, pleasure is guilty, right? A guilty pleasure. Pleasure is something we, we, we have to earn or we have to deserve and that is just it's such a lie and it's such a lie to keep us all like in in a certain state right 
a certain state of fear, a certain state of insecurity, a certain state of lack, if we all truly loved ourselves and truly moved through the world, yeah, enslaved, enslaved. That is not too strong of a word for this. So this is like subversive shit. Like we can talk about pleasure and oh, it's very light and yeah, have fun and be like putting pleasure first and prioritizing pleasure in your body is actually seriously subversive work. And as women, we have a lot of ancestral conditioning against this too, right? Like women were burned at the stake, like literally killed for being witches and whores and bitches, right? I love Amy Lorbati's witch, bitch, whore triad, like those three things. The first time I heard that, I was just like, I can't even hear those words. Those are so dangerous for me. Much less step in and embody those archetypes. So yeah, I just want to touch on that. Like this is seemingly simple work, but it's also, it's revolutionary. It's it's subversive, it's change making, it's change bringing. And when you do this for yourself, that rising tide metaphor is true. Like you can't help but affect the people around you by feeding yourself. And we'll talk about this a little bit more when I touch on the blueprints, like the blueprints are the way to learn how to feed your body. So if you're also like at the beginning of this journey and being like, I'm looking in and not feeling a lot of pleasure, there is there are tools for that. Like you can literally learn how to wire your body for your individual blueprint. And I encourage you to always, always support is the big thing too. Having siblinghood people that you can reach out to, having a coach, literally a sex coach, a pleasure coach, a mindset coach, like these things exist and they're invaluable. I'm check my notes for a second. Again, I'm just like, I'm getting on my soapbox here. Um, Oh, and then I also wanted to say like what pleasure is not, because this often gets confusing, like pleasure is not a performance, like true embodied pleasure is not a performance, it's not something done for somebody else's benefit, and we see a lot of performative pleasure, this is an example we're shown over and over and over again, especially around women and sex, that like our job is to be performative, we're going to show that we're having a good time and gratify the ego and make sure that everybody's happy. And blah. Like, I can't tell you how many years sex was literally just performative for me. Like all I was consumed and concerned with was whether or not I looked right, sounded right, smelled right. I mean, my pleasure, like I didn't even <laughs> consider it. I didn't even think about it, which holding myself a little bit there around that and again like a lot of that's conditioning um so to get away from this idea that pleasure has to be for anybody else like pleasure is it comes from your body it's built within your body you get to experience pleasure in whatever way your body wants to experience and wants to express it pleasure could be loud pleasure could be silent pleasure could be big pleasure could be really small and there's no like right or wrong. There's no hierarchy to types of pleasure. Pleasure is what feels good to you. Um, yeah, and the pleasure mindset, like linking to yesterday, pleasure is a mindset. So mindset's the foundation, <clears throat> pleasure is the fuel. Again, I'm a little mixed up with that metaphor. I'm still working through it, the car, the fuel, but literally what we're doing with this work and i've said this before and i just want to say it again we are rewiring our brain like we've had a lot of wiring in one direction what we're doing is really like rewiring our brain rewiring our nervous system to accept and receive and experience pleasure so again if this doesn't come easy to you right off the bat be be patient and loving with yourself and recognize that maybe there's just a lot to unwind and unravel and support might be welcome and necessary. And then what's on the other side is the best, <laughs> like a body open to receiving and experience and expressing pleasure, not only brings so much joy and happiness to you, but so much joy and happiness to the people around you, to your community, to your lover, to your family, like to your pets. I mean, it's just, yeah. And we wanna feed ourselves with pleasure so that we can join our families and our communities and our lovers and our pets from that place of overflow, right? And that's where the blueprints come in is like, if you don't know even like what you want and what feels good and how to feed yourself 
a most likely you're depending on somebody else to do that for you and they're miserably failing because <laughs> that's the nature of the game um and b yeah I'm, i that's i lost my train of thought on b but um Yeah, essentially like knowing yourself, knowing your own body is the most important work. And I know I came to this blueprint work because I was, I wanted more better sex. I wanted to just be having like lots more better sex and I didn't have any moves for it. Like I'd been in a long-term partnership. Like I said yesterday, we've been together almost 20, 20 years this week. And when we got together, we were in our early twenties and much like your mindset is different in your early 20s, your sexual mindset is different in your early 20s than it is in your late 20s, in your early 30s, in your late 30s, in your 40s, in your 50s, in your like. And I didn't know that. We didn't have any roadmap given to us. We didn't have any languaging given to us. We didn't have any help. I mean, all we had was porn, you know? I was like, okay, we can go rent different types of porn and that could, could take you a certain, you know, that could take you so far. <laughs> it didn't actually help us with the tough stuff, right? With the tough stuff about like, what are my desires that I'm, that I'm afraid to even voice here? What are, what are some desires that I didn't have in my early twenties that are coming up now? Um, do these desires, you know, rock the foundation of our relationship? Like all of that stuff was happening. All the energy was there, but there were no words to put to it. And so we slowly, grew apart sexually and physically because we didn't have that language and that communication. So the irony for me is I hired a blueprint coach to teach him how to be a better lover. <laughs> I was like, because that was the story that I had been given was that I, you know, and I'm all, I sometimes wonder like, where did I hear the story? Is it like a Disney story? But the story I had was that I was supposed to wait until a man showed me my body a man was supposed to like teach me the secrets and pleasures of my body and I kept sort of like waiting for that to happen and when the man like wasn't doing it I was like well I'm here I'm doing my part I'm smelling right I'm sounding right I am <laughs> you know doing the things and I was not taking responsibility for my own pleasure. And so the real turnaround, the real needle mover with the blueprints was realizing that it was not about this coach teaching my lover how to please me. It was about me learning what pleased me to even like start to have that conversation with myself. And it was such an awesome experience to have that safe place to talk about sex. Like I had tried to bring this up with our couples therapist some months before and I could just feel like I'm a very energetic person. I could feel the shutdown from our therapist around talking about sex. Like he didn't, he didn't have the moves either. And I was just like, oh my God, this is hopeless. <laughs> like I'm never gonna have what I need. So having like somebody who was non-judgmental, who I could, you know, to, to talk to both of us, to, to give us a safe place, a safe communication around sex and sexuality was, just priceless and and then they introduced us to the to the blueprints and i don't want to spend like too 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 much time but i'll tease you a little bit with like what the different blueprints are and you'll see as i go through them like how important it is like if you didn't even know this framework and you didn't have any idea that you were maybe like leaning towards one or the other or that your partner was one or the other you very well can find yourself in a situation of perceived sexual incompatibility. I'm just like, we just don't work together. Nine times out of 10, you're literally just different blueprints and you haven't been given the framework for understanding each other. So that is to me the best, the best tool for anybody exploring sexuality and pleasure. And like I say often, like pleasure doesn't have to be about sex. Like pleasure can be, and well, again, get into the blueprints and I'll, each blueprint experiences pleasure differently. There is a sexual blueprint to which pleasure is sex. It is like, do it, come, fuck, relax. That is pleasure. And then for other blueprints, it looks very, very different. So again, when we talk about this, this is not hierarchical. One blueprint is not better or worse than the other. They're just different. And the better that you can understand yourself and 
other people, the better all of your relationships can be. And the sex gets explosive. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> like, I can say, you can use the blueprints for parenting, for business, for relationships, but using the blueprints on sex is where it's at. So let's dive in. Um, do anybody have any questions or comments before I, it's not just Disney's the entire, yes, thank you. It's not just Disney, it's the entire culture. And I, I always get the image of, I mean, it's not just one of them who falls asleep, right? Like Snow White falls asleep and Rapunzel, no, the uh, Sleeping Beauty, <laughs> duh. Like they literally go immobile and unconscious until somebody comes and kisses them. Oh, Snow White. <laughs> Okay, so the erotic blueprints were a framework that were created for people to understand arousal and desire. It's like they were created by our mentor Jaya. Um, and they were interestingly enough created out, and she's like a sex expert galore. She's been in sex and sexuality for 20 years, and she created the blueprints out of a sexual deficit in her own relationship. She was like, I am a sexual goddess, I know all the tips and tricks, and my relationship is foundering, like what is going on? And so she and her partner dove in and they discovered these five different ways of wiring. And a lot of people think of it like the love languages. I think that's a good metaphor too, or good analogy. Like they are the love languages of sex and desire and arousal. So we often start with the energetic blueprint. And I have a real soft spot for the energetic blueprint because my partner is an energetic. The energetic blueprint is really turned on by space. They like tease, they like anticipation. They like to like build up tension from like across the room. They like to have like unspoken love making occurring like between two sets of eyes. They can literally like have orgasmic Orga orgasmic orgasms <laughs> without even being touched. That is one of the superpowers. The energetics in your life are the super hypersensitive ones. They're the ones that can read the room. They're the ones that need to often, like, like a classic introvert, perhaps, like who needs to like maybe take breaks. They can get easily overwhelmed, easily um, overloaded. One of their shadows is they can just sh kind of short circuit if things come at them too fast, too hard. Um, <clears throat> I think energetic men are often really misunderstood because there's a lot of social conditioning around like what the genders are, how they're supposed to appear in sexuality. So a lot of men might perform, they might put on like a sexual mask because they don't feel that they're energetic. They feel that that might read as like too feminine, too sensitive, not, you know, not powerful enough. So there can often be like a lot of shadow around that, like shame around, you know, being energetically sensitive as a man. Um, we often talk about each blueprint in terms of like superpowers and shadows. I would say, again, the superpower of an energetic is like reading another body without touch, being able to literally come from non-touch, like full on like chakra based. The energetic is also like transcendent with sexuality. They can like commune with gods and goddesses. They're out in the galaxy. And that can also be a shadow too. Like sometimes an energetic in their shadow is a little bit like holier than thou around sex. Like, like oh, you wanna like have vaginal penetration. Like I have sex with, I make love with my heart, you know? <laughs> like. They can sometimes like get stuck in that like I do this better because it's like really on this like godly plane. Um, also with energetic there's two types, which I love that there's kind of like the light energetic which to me is sort of like heart forward radiant goddess energy just like radiating love and light like that archetype is the light energetic just like really like drawing people towards you with that loving bright energy and then there's the dark energetic kind of like pulls you in with more of like 
like a huntress or like a predator kind of energy like like a dark energetic would stalk you around a party you know and and you would feel them like coming up behind you and just like <laughs> there can be so much like fun to be played with the energetic um and energetics like sex for an energetic can just look different right it doesn't mean necessarily that there will be penetration or there will be a genital based orgasm like an energetic could orgasm from you know hovering touch and like chimes around their body like they're just so sensitive to all the energetic frequencies so the the energetic is so delicious to play with and it helps you if you're not energetic and your partner is can really help you to like cultivate that part of your own self we all have energetic capacity and a lot of us like we forget that because we don't get to embody that so so that's the energetic the sensual blueprint is is the blueprint that is just turned on by their senses being loved on so they love like soft touch they want like hot oil massage they want silky blankets and cashmere sweaters they want cozy mugs of hot chocolate they want beautiful vistas and delicious decadent spreads of sweet meats and you know mead <laughs> they're just like luxury like give it to me like touch me they want like skin to skin contact oh i love you maria hope your son's okay um thinking of noah um yeah, the sensual, they really are turned on by, by all of that. They want like, like if the energetic wants a little distance, the sensual, or the sensual, yeah, wants to be like wrapped up as much of their skin touching your skin as possible. They love cuddle puddles, like <sighs> sensuals love touch. And the superpower of the sensual is they can create the most beautiful sensual experiences for their lovers. They can also be like extremely, <clears throat> it's not quite like the way the energetic can be turned on by like not touch. What am I trying to say? The sensual superpower is that they are like full body they like bring their full body into the experience so and that also kind of brings you into the shadow of them because essential in their shadow gets out of their body so like that's kind of a good way to describe it like essential in their superpower is fully fully embodied they are aware of and experiencing through all of their senses and essential in their shadow is like cut off from part of their body. They're like up in their head. They're worrying about like their taxes or balancing their checkbook, which is such an old fashioned thing. I just said nobody does that anymore. Um, or also like essential can get distracted by mess. Like if the room isn't right, if the environment isn't right, that can be very distracting. I experience essential shadow around like um, like bodily mess, like like if it's too too much sweat or like fluids. Sometimes I can just like get like grossed out and be like, nah, I need to go take a shower. Um, that's definitely part of the sensual shadow. And sensuals really need to be like relaxed in their body before they're ready to have sex. That's one thing that really sets a sensual aside. So pop a blindfold on a sensual is very helpful tip. It will help them to be in their body and not so much like looking around and where you basically cut off one of their senses. Essential would probably love uh, like a float tank, a sensory deprivation tank, where they just get to like be. Um, and then you think about like essential being somebody who really needs to be in their body and relaxed in order to have sex. That is pretty opposite to the next blueprint type, which is the sexual. And I've talked a little bit about that. The sexual really needs to like get off in order to be relaxed and in their body. Like sex to a sexual blueprint is as important as food, air, water. It's like, it's like breathing. Like a sexual needs to have regular sex. They need to have regular orgasms. They need to know when that's happening. Like an energetic might get super turned on if you tease them with the possibility of sex at the end of a date, but you don't know if it's really gonna happen. And the energetic is just like, oh my God, is this really gonna happen? And the sexual is like, 
what you 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 say I might get to, like they like won't have fun on that date they're just gonna be like I don't get it like what do I have to do to ensure that I get sex at the end like what it feels manipulative like that would make a sexual upset whereas it could really turn on energetic so you can start to see how different blueprints they want to be engaged with different ways they want to be touched in different ways they want to be flirted with in different ways so the more that you can a know yourself like how do i want to be approached how do i want to be touched how do i want to be pleasured and then you start to like you can you can really start to tell what other people's blueprints are just by observing how they move through the world how they dress how they talk it's fascinating and then you kind of know how to work with them either in the bedroom or out so love me some sexuals the sexual um the sexual superpower is, I think of it as like, they bring the fun to the party. Like they are, they show up ready to play, ready to come. Like they want to see tits and ass. They want orgasms. They want to fuck. Like they, like their language is like quick and direct and to the point. And it's like, yeah, like this is simple and straightforward. Like sex is one of the greatest gifts we, we have been given, like as, as human beings, like let's do it all the time. And then a sexual, like maybe a sexual in their shadow might be, um, sometimes sexuals can have a hard time relating to the other blueprints. Like I said, the energetic and sexual is a common coupling. It's like that opposites attract thing. They're the most common couples who come to us and are like, we just don't get, we're not compatible. And it's like, no, you're just an energetic and a sexual doggy paddling through the ocean trying desperately to find a life raft to climb upon <laughs> shared experience <laughs> and it's tough um so yeah they can have trouble identifying the other blueprints don't make sense to them it's like confusing and weird um they can also like i think often if you find somebody who struggles with consent violations boundary issues that can also be a sexual in their shadow um, it sort of is the way that like men have been conditioned to express themselves in our culture. And sometimes that's a little bit of a, like, I take what I want kind of vibe. Like even in partnership, I sometimes think of like a sexual is the type who will walk by their partner and just like slap them on the ass. And then their partner's like, Oh, why did you do that? And they're like, what? Your ass was literally like right there like how could I not like they are just like I can't stop myself um so yeah and again it's like each one of these has has their superpower and their shadows so it's like you gotta love them all and then the fourth one is the kinky blueprint this is the one I have been diving into most lately which has been bringing me so much pleasure, specifically pleasure around liberation and transformation. Um, all the blueprints are good for this. Kink to me has been the most potent tool for this particular um, effect. And kink, the kinky blueprint is basically anybody who's turned on by anything outside of the normal, right? Anything that is taboo to that person. So. A lot of people think kink means BDSM and that's just like what it is. And that is a huge world within the kink realm. And that's probably like a lot of people's entry point in terms of exposure. But, but I would love people to expand that definition to really like anything that feels taboo or outside of your comfort zone for you. Um, we did a great, and I'll, you know, I'll just invite everyone to do this right now. We'll take like three minutes to do this. And if you're doing the replay, um, take, if you have a pen and paper, I invite you to take your pen and paper and draw two lines. So like one down, like an axis. So you have four quadrants. And we'll call the upper left one and the upper right two, bottom left three and the bottom right four. And we'll just take like, three minutes, four minutes on this. We'll do a minute each. So for one minute in quadrant one, I want you to write down everything that you consider normal vanilla sex. Like that you consider what everybody else would consider normal vanilla sex.
Okay, so maybe like wrap that up with one thing and we can <clears throat> continue to add to this, you know, in the future. Um, but just to get a few things down. And then in um, number two, I want you to write like what is sex for you? And you don't have to share this. Like, so this is just, this is just for you to kind of get this out on paper. Like what you like to do during sex that doesn't necessarily fit into that first. It may, but it may not. It's kind of like what outside of the norm do you like to engage in? Okay, and if you want to finish up column first, quadrant two, moving into quadrant three, this is the shadow. So in this quadrant, I want you to list out everything that you want to do deep down, but you don't do. So anything that's like your deepest fantasy, the thing that like you might even not admit to your lover, to yourself, like what feels like something that you desire to do, but is like off limits to you. And again, you don't have to share this. This is just for yourself. Something you've always wanted to try, but never experienced. And then once you've gotten a few things down for column three, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yes. um, so number four, I would encourage you to write down, what are the reasons that you haven't done the things in number three? What is the story that you tell yourself about? why that's not possible or appropriate or available. So this is a little exercise that um, I learned at my um, recent kink adventure weekend, and it's called a shadow assessment. So you can kind of think about that, that number one space as like, it's almost like our indoctrination. It's like what we have been, what we've been told, it's like what we don't question, right? And, and what's interesting is that when you're in a group and people do share, what's what's in that number one spot is vastly different from one person to another like what one person thinks is normal vanilla sex one person could have porn in that and one person could have porn in their in in box number three like that thing that they've always wanted to try but don't allow themselves to do so it's a good exercise for just seeing like a how different we all are be like, what do we, what have we been indoctrinated around sexuality and pleasure? Like what is possible? What is okay? And then the shadows are kind of like an indicator for us of like, this is where we need some integration. Like that's part number three. It's like, this is maybe where our body, our desires are giving us a flag that some integration is necessary. 
And number four is such a juicy portion because that is where you're essentially like listing out your personal myths, right? Like the myths that you have, the stories that you have created for yourself for why you can't do what it is that you want to do. And that is some powerful mindset shit. But if you don't do the exercise, sometimes you don't even know that's there. So it's like, you can pull this stuff out. You can do the mindset work on it. You open up the body to pleasure. That's where the liberation, that's where the transformation, that's where the freedom exists is on the other side. So kink is about playing with your edges, playing with your boundaries and boundaries can be moved, right? So you could set up a boundary, you could play to that edge and then you could move that boundary out a little bit and say, okay, I'm gonna play to this edge and I'm gonna play to this edge now. So kink when it's done with safety and consent and playfulness and joy to me is like the key to expansion. It's the key to allowing yourself the space to literally surrender into what is my body capable of in terms of pleasure. The shadow side of kink is people can be so ashamed about wanting something that doesn't fit into box number one, right? Like they could just have so much internalized shame that 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 kink desire gets repressed and eventually suppressed until it doesn't even, maybe they don't even remember that it's there. So I think like that's, yeah. It's a, uh, it's one of, again, one of society's gifts to us that, that the kink blueprint has been so demonized, right? And so, so put in the shadows, right? That whole blueprint literally to many people is just a shadow space. And to me is actually like such a beautiful light space of stepping into like, what is possible for you? What is out there? Kink to me brings in all the like joy and imagination and play of being a child with the beauty of and fun and pleasure of consensual adult sex. It's like the best of all worlds. So if kink to you is like something that you feel is very far away that you don't wanna experience, A, just know that it doesn't have to look like whips and chains and pain and hurt. That's actually like not what it's about at all. And that it's actually a, a place to explore safe containers for expansion. And then we're running low on time. So I'm just going to like zip through the last blueprint. I know it always gets short shrift. People are always like, oh, I'll just skip that one. And it's like, never skip it. Because it is, it is literally all of our destiny. And the fifth and final blueprint is the shapeshifter blueprint. And the shapeshifter blueprint is all of them. They have all the superpowers, they can play in all the spaces, they can play in the energetic, they can play in the sexual, they can be in the kinky, they can play dominant, they can, I mean, they love it all, they want it all, they want more and more and more sensations, like a shapeshifter, you touch them one way, you add in another touch, they're like, yeah, that feels even better, you add in a third touch, it feels even better. For a lot of like energetics, one or two touches is like enough for their nervous system. You know you are dealing with a shapeshifter when you start adding things in and their pleasure just goes up and up and up and up. And they just like, they can go for hours and hours. They want more and more and more. They can also have all of the shadows. This is the sad flip side of the, <laughs> the shapeshifter conundrum is that, and, and I say this as a, recovering shapeshifter myself. Like I think when I approached the blueprints, I didn't realize that I was such a deeply starved shapeshifter, how I had cut off so many of my desires, had totally cut off my kinky self. Um, I didn't understand my energetic self. Um, I guess recovering now, and I maybe when I arrived at the work, it was like a wounded or starving shapeshifter who like needed recovery. So I think it's still, and I've been on this journey for a few years now, and I'd still, I'd still call myself a, a shapeshifter in recovery. I had deep people-pleasing wounds. I, I couldn't, I mean, when we talk about the bloomers, we talk about sex, it's like, what is, what do you want in the bed? What do you want in your body? Like, what does your body want sexually? I couldn't even tell you like what I wanted off of a menu. I couldn't make like basic decisions. I would, I would give away that power over and over and over again, because, you know, if somebody else had a desire or a need, 
it, I didn't. So I would just support theirs. I would just, I would feed and feed and feed. And I didn't know how to get fed. I didn't know how to feed myself. I didn't know how to ask to be fed. So it, it was not a, an accident that I showed up to this work feeling very starved and having like not a very good sex life. <laughs> it was the product of many years of putting other people's needs and experiences ahead of mine to the point where I numbed myself out even to like knowing what that was. So, and that kind of brings us into tomorrow, which is radical reclamation. And it's like, once you have that foundation of mindset work, once you've gotten that sexual piece in play, and a lot, for a lot of people, like I said, the sexual life, their sexual life is like the last frontier. They've done self-development work, they've done business development work, they've done personal <clears throat> growth seminars, whatever, but nobody's really like talked about like what's going on sexually in the body. So once you've got your mindset down, your erotic expansion, your pleasure mindset going, it's like, what is it that you want to reclaim? Like what parts of yourself have been cut off? What parts of yourself are yearning for expression? And that's kind of what we're going to go into tomorrow is more like, what does that integrated self look like? What does it feel like? What can you produce from that space and that place? So I'm going to look at my notes real quick, make sure I'm not Yeah, I mean, the only thing that I didn't say is that pleasure and sexuality stimulates creativity. That's kind of where we started. The more fun you're having, and you don't need a partner to have a lot of sexual pleasure in your life. Like I preach all the time, like be your own best lover. Like if you are your own best lover, you will A, not need anybody and B, you will be attracting lovers to you right and left. Like people find that magnetic. Like they just, they wanna be a part of that pleasure. And we are creative beings. So sex and sexuality, having fun with it, releasing shame around it can help make all the rest of our life fun and playful and exciting again. So this is the time where we're gonna close the official Ignite the Temple Within container. Um, does anybody have any questions? I know it's just the end of the hour now, but I'm happy to stay on for a few extra minutes. If anyone has questions, and then I'm happy to tell you about my new offering as well. Cool. So I'm going to move into that real quick. I was thinking about um, I was thinking about this topic today of pleasure and and the idea of the nectary. So the nectary is my new offering, and it's a group program. And I was thinking about this metaphor because like nectar, the function of nectar in the flower, it's like, it's that sweet syrup that attracts the pollinators, right? And pollination is like plant sex. It's all related to sex, you guys. <laughs> so the butterflies, the bees, the hummingbirds, they're all attracted to this like sugary secretion that the plant produces. And then when they're there drinking it in, they're, they're picking the pollen up on their wings or their legs or whatever. And then they're flying off to drink the nectar of another plant, thus dropping the pollen and propagating and fertilizing the plants, et cetera. So I was thinking of this idea that like, that nectar is the lure for the flower, right? And that nectar is the same as pleasure in our bodies. Like the more we can cultivate pleasure in our bodies, the more we can like lure the pollinators to us, whether that's pollinators to impregnate us if that's where we're at in our lives or pollinators to help us you know with our business pollinators to help us with um, co-creation of ideas like cross-pollination attracted by like sweetness and sugar and pleasure was this whole like image that was coming through to me so in the flower itself this sugary syrup is formed in a section of the flower called the nectary. So that is why I wanted to call this group program the nectary to kind of keep that metaphor going that this is the place where we are going to work together to create more and more pleasure for ourselves in our bodies and thus use that pleasure for creation. So nectar to a flower is like pleasure to the body. It's like that sweet, sweet stuff. 
And in the nectary, we're going to be actually cultivating our pleasure in service of creation. So cultivating pleasure for the ultimate benefit of creating whatever it is that we have on our horizon. So what's in it for you? Creation, pleasure, community, support, expansion. This is truly going to be a journey of liberation and transformation. So seven months, we're going to be working with um, the seasonal journey of spring into summer. So I actually timed this out for the seasons of the Western hemisphere. So we actually have seven full months to, to do the springtime work of planting our seeds, tilling our soil, figuring out like how we want that garden to look and nurturing and nourishing it. We're gonna tend those little shoots into the blooms of summer. So we're going all the way through the summer. We'll get that radiant sun energy like coming in onto our desires, into our bodies, into our pleasure, radiating throughout. And I see this, like I said, as a capsule for creation. So whatever it is that you want to be bringing into your life in 2022, doesn't matter, like I said, if you are a coach or if you are a business owner, if you wanna create a family, you wanna create whatever it is that you are in creation mode for, this is the place where you're gonna be able to nurture it through pleasure. And I also want this to be a place where we can get fresh perspective and learn about the things that have been hidden from us. The suit keeps coming up that there is a certain amount of knowledge that we are just not being taught. And I'm, it's part of my personal mission to ferret those things out, like figure out like where are these, where are these pockets of hidden knowledge and how can I bring those things to light? So this is again, in essence, a journey towards transformation and liberation. So this is for anybody who is creative and passionate. Those are literally my prerequisites. Like you have to be a creative person. You have to be a passionate person in order to really feel at home in the nectary. And what you're going to get is group work that's built around seven secret salons. So the seven secret salons are going to be, um, I, I'm kind of toying with the new moon nectary lecture series on the forbidden topics. So these are not the things that they teach you about in school. It is my desire to bring like a brief little presentation for each of these that is guaranteed to amuse, to titillate, to enrich, and that you'll come away with something that you never knew before, something that you can share with other people and, you know, sort of like fodder for your next cocktail party, you know. Um, and it's gonna be like fun stuff, fun stuff on like sexuality, um, women's history, plant medicine, religious traditions, goddess worship, past and present. Like there's a lot of really juicy topics kind of in the ether now. And I also have reached out to a few guest experts as well to come and um, pop into those too. So that group work will be around a, that little like 30-ish minute lecture series on the forbidden topics. And then B, we're also gonna be doing new moon rituals for clearing and intention setting. So each month we're gonna be working with really potent symbols and archetypes that are relevant to each of our energy centers. We're starting at the bottom with the foundation. We're gonna be working our way up. This is not like any other like chakra based program you've ever worked with. This is not yoga related. This is not tantra related. This is really divinely transmitted, like deep archetypal energy work. That's about all I can say about it. It's witchy and it's woo and it's powerful AF. And so each month we're gonna learn from a particular crystal, an essential aroma, a spiritual ally and a magical place. And this is the part that's like really guaranteed to shift the shit. It's like the part that's a little bit hard to talk about because it's kind of on the wooer end, but this is probably like the most potent transmission element that exists in the program. You're also gonna get one private creation call with me each month. This is our chance to just be together and to hang out and for me to put my laser focus on you and what you're creating. So this could be getting my eyes on your business. This could be getting my eyes on your sex life, on your relationship woes. Um, this could be us just hanging out, taking a bath together, shooting the shit, like whatever feels most supportive and fun to you. Like this is my chance to just be with you and bond with you. So I wanna have 
a like group siblinghood and sisterhood and also a chance for me to connect every month with you individually and help you with my own creative juice to build and grow like this is as I said yesterday my specialty is really like this mind is a creative brainstorming machine I come up with fun shit weird shit things like nobody else would ever think of um that is my superpower so I am more than happy to rain that down on you. Um, and again, that's just like we're getting creative together. We're gonna have a Facebook group for ongoing support. And again, siblinghood, this is a really important aspect of the program. And my probably my favorite part of this, bespoke fairy porn. And I talked a little bit about like being subversive earlier and modeling this on like, the 18th century, like French salons of the enlightenment, which were really, again, like subversive spaces. These were places where women got together to share intellectual knowledge, to share ideas, to foment revolution, right? So like, though this is, you know, woo and witchy and fun and pleasure, there is also like a subversive element to it. So the fairy porn is part of that. Like I want to create whimsical, pleasurable, fairy porn to help us like start to unpack some of the like negative <laughs> some of the negative stereotypes we have around porn and our interaction with it so like my desire is to shower your inbox with whimsical sexual hilarious images and short stop motion films that are nsfw and just for the nectary like this is content that it will not be shared with anyone else and i guarantee you will not find any program out there that is offering this so well worth taking advantage of and then the last thing is gifts this was a non-negotiable for me i want this program to include gifts like good ones so every month you're going to get a gift from me it's going to be in the form of a box or something special Flow. I mean, I don't even, I have ideas. I don't want to say too much because I want them to be a surprise, but I want this to be a space where you feel safe and where you feel special. I want to see you in your uniqueness and your specialness. I want to give you the tools that you need to feel all the pleasure in your body that you want so that you can take that up and out and again, like spread it out into the world. And we sometimes like, need a nest from which to do that like you know i i think of like baby birds kicked out too early and they can't they can't fly and they are cold and then it's their mom and it's like i want to provide the nectary as like a beautiful like nesting space for us to be together to grow to hatch to plant it's like all of the springtime imagery is coming through with this offer and we start on march 9th and anybody who signs up in February is going to get a special price. So February signups is one, 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 one per month. So it's $1,111 per month for seven months, the investment. And I also had kind of a pussy hit and I'm gonna say it right now. If you're listening to this on the replay, sorry. But for the three of you who are here live, anybody who comes to all three live, and you were all here yesterday, anybody who comes to all three days live gets a special price of 777 for every month of the thing. So that's really for the three of you. <laughs> that's only for the three of you. I'm throwing it out there. Um, if you come tomorrow and you decide that the nectary is within your ultimate pleasure to experience, that is a special um, little bonus for you for giving all of your delicious live energy to this event. So for the rest of you <clears throat> on the recording, it'll be 10 people intimate group, sign up in February, one, 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 one per month for seven months. And the price will rise in March, probably by a hundred or $200. So get in now. And if you have any questions, any like, desire to explore that further, hop on a call with me. I'm always here for you. And I hope to see you tomorrow. We're gonna to do radical reclamation. We're all about integrating what we've been doing the last couple of days, figuring out what the future holds for us. And I'm so happy that you all were able to join today. Thank you so much. Mwah. Let me stop recording. Mwah.